Welcome back everybody to another video lecture from Ms. Simino. Today we're going to be talking about solutions, how you can make them, how you can make them faster, as well as the units and the calculations that we use to express concentrations. So for Chemistry 1 students, this is going to be um, in Chapter 16. Um, in my Chemistry Honors students, this is probably Chapters 12 and Chapters 13. It's kind of a combination of those two. So as I said, one of our objectives is to identify the factors that determine the rate at which a solute dissolves, so how fast or slow is something going to dissolve. We're going to talk about the units used to express the solubility of a solute, so when we look at those solubility graphs, you'll be, know those units on there. We're also going to be looking at the factors that determine how much or will determine the mass of solute that will dissolve in a given mass of solvent. So when we're making a solution, a couple of things we want to think about is, well, one, will the solution actually form? Will these two things mix? And one of the things that I think we've talked about in class is the polarity or nonpolar substances. So we'll sometimes say that sugar and water will mix, um, but water and oil won't mix. And that's because water is considered polar and oil is considered nonpolar. Something else that we'll look at here is factors that determine the rate of the solution. And so we, we're all familiar with this. If we stir something, it's going to turn into the solution faster. It's going to mix faster. The surface area, um, smaller particles are going to dissolve faster. And generally, hotter temperatures make um, solutions quicker. So on this slide, making solutions. In order to dissolve, the solvent molecules must come in contact with the solute. So one way to do this is with stirring, also known as agitation. Um, that moves the fresh solvent into contact with the solute. Sometimes you're going to hear me say this encourages more solute-solvent interactions. Also helpful are these smaller pieces. They increase the amount of surface area on a solute. A good example of this, you guys, is if you've ever used a breath mint before, like a piece of candy. If you don't chew it up, if you just leave it whole in your mouth, it probably takes a good 10 minutes for it to dissolve. But if you chew it up, you actually make it dissolve faster, and that's because there's more surface area or more places for those solute-solvent interactions to happen on like the chewed up piece of that breath mint. Another factor that increases the rate at which a solution will dissolve is higher temperatures. This makes the molecules of the solvent move faster. Remember we recently talked about the kinetic molecular theory, and temperature is really a measure of the kinetic energy of particles. So this higher temperature means that these particles are moving faster, and, so, um, and they come into contact um, with the solute harder and more often. So this is going to speed up dissolving. Now there is an exception to this, so usually you guys, um, temperature does help increase um, the solution process, but with gases, actually at higher temperatures, with gases, it slows it down. And this down here, um, probably a practical example is if you've ever had a soda. If you have a cold soda, it stays um, uh, carbonated longer, but if your soda is ho hotter, it goes flatter faster. So one of the things that we need to be able to do is to read these solubility graphs or these solubility curves. And so um, in order to do that, let's just go ahead and go through these couple of quick questions here. So the first question that we're looking at down here, it says describe um, what happens to the solubility of potassium nitrate as the temperature increases. And so potassium nitrate is this purple one right here. So if we look down here at this axis, we can see this is temperature, increasing temperature. So as the temperature increases, we're increasing the amount of solute that can be dissolved. Okay? So up here is our answer. The solubility of potassium nitrate increases as the temperature increases. Okay, the next question says which substance shows a decrease in solubility as temperature increases? So we want to look for like a negative slope, um, one that's going down. So in this case, you can see this green line is uh, sloping down here. Um, so this shows a decrease in solubility as the temperature increases. Um, and then the other part of that question was which substance exhibits the least change in solubility, and that's going to be our sodium chloride right here. So you can see how like that orange line is flat, so its solubility really doesn't change with a change in temperature. And then the last one here talks about, um, suppose you added some sodium chloride to a saturated solution of sodium chloride at 20 degrees and warmed the mixture to 40 degrees, what would happen to the sodium chloride? Well, you know, only a small amount is actually going to be dissolved. Um, probably the rest of it's just going to sit at the bottom of the container because, as we said, salt doesn't really increase um, the solubility as the temperature increases. 
And one last thing I just want to remind you guys about is when we see these um, lines curving upwards, we'll call that a positive slope. And when we see them going down, it's a negative slope. It's just one of those things that you'll see in your textbook. So here are the two general trends that you need to know. You need to know that solids tend to dissolve best when they're heated, when they're stirred, and when they're in smaller particles, and we know that. On the other hand, this is the new part, is that gases tend to dissolve best when the solution is cold and when there's high pressure. So remember, for dissolving something, we're mixing these two things. So in the case of soda, you've got this liquid and you've got this carbon dioxide gas, you're trying to squeeze these gas particles in there. So since you're trying to squeeze them in there, the high pressure is good. And then, like I said, the cold is good because if it was hotter, those gas particles would wiggle their way out of the solution. On this slide, we're going to talk about some words that we use to describe solutions, um, and well as how we can describe how much or how soluble something is. So the definition for solubility is the maximum amount of substance that will dissolve at a specific temperature, and the units for this are grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent. Usually our solvent we're talking about is water, but that's just generally how it goes. How much solute can you put per 100 grams of solvent? And the terms that we like to use are a saturated solution. So it contains the maximum amount of solute dissolved. Okay. Um, the example that I always like to use for this is making chocolate milk. So if you, I really like chocolate, like chocolatey chocolate milk, so I can usually put like a good three spoons of spoonfuls of this quick into my milk um, and to keep it all like up in solution and it's like super chocolatey, super perfect. And so I would say in that case, my three scoops is a saturated solution. However, sometimes my kids use up all of the Nesquik and I still want some chocolate milk and I'm only putting one scoop of Nesquik into my milk. And so we would call this an unsaturated solution. So definitely if I'm only getting one scoop into my um, glass of milk, I could put two more in there so there's more solute that could be dissolved. And then finally, super saturated. Sometimes I need a chocolate fix, so I might put more than the three little scoops of um, Nesquik into my glass. But what generally ends up happening is that Nesquik ends up falling to the bottom of the um, glass. And so in that case, I'm like trying to stir it really fast to try to get it all up into the milk um, so that I'm not just scooping the Nesquik off the bottom. So in that case, if I was to add more, like four or five scoops, we would call that a super saturated solution. So it's holding more than you, ought, you thought it might hold, okay, or theoretically hold. So one term that we do need to talk about is saturation and the equilibrium, or sometimes this is known as a solution equilibrium. And it sounds complicated, but it's really not. So if we kind of go back to this idea about me dissolving chocolate um, Nesquik in my milk, you guys can see here's the Nesquik sitting here. So initially what happens is some of this solute moves up into the solution. Um, over here, um, we can see that there's um, it's still moving up into the solution, but there are some that are going to fall to the bottom. We've all had that perfectly mixed glass of chocolate milk where we did have a few of those crystals on the bottom. And then a sa saturation equilibrium is established. Well, there's just as much um, that will hold up in solution. So you guys seeing how these arrows are equally balanced. There's an equal amount going into solution and an equal amount crystallizing. An interesting example of a super saturated like solution um, is this idea of seeding the clouds to make rain, and they really do do this. Students often say, "Miss Simino, isn't that just a old wives' tale or something?" No, we really do this, especially here in Nevada. So clouds, um, they're masses of air, super saturated with water vapors. We'll put this liquid iodine crystals are dusted into the clouds, like with a crop duster, like with a plane. And so this is called the seeding. And then this silver iodide attracts the water, forming droplets that attract others. And so this condensing of the water droplets can um, help it make it rain more often than it normally would. Okay, here's a couple of quick terms just to discuss this idea of miscible, partially miscible, and immiscible. So miscible means that the two liquids can dissolve in each other. So water and antifreeze, water and eth ethanol, if you were to mix those substances together, they mix okay. Um, partly miscible or partly um, dissolves together um, are water and ether. And so those two sort of mix, you can sort of see some layers happening there. And then, of course, when we have like oil and vinegar salad dressing, you definitely can see the two layers there. And so we would say that those would be immiscible. 
So we know that for solids and liquids, the temperature goes up, the solubility goes up. But as we discussed a minute ago, as um, the temperature goes up for gases, they're decreasing in solubility. And so a common example or problem with this or a way to use this information is this idea of thermal pollution. So often what happens is companies will be working along a river and they'll have some water. And even though maybe maybe per chance that their water is not contaminated with anything, they'll be pumping it back into the stream or the river. But what ends up generally happening is this water that's coming from the companies is hotter than the temperature of the stream or the river. So what ends up happening is as this water gets hotter in the river, it actually makes there be less oxygen in the water for the fish. And you can see fish die offs by these industrial areas because remember what we said, the hotter the water or the hot, hotter the solution, the less gas it can contain in that solution. And so that makes sense that the gas that fish and other aquatic life needs is oxygen. If it's hotter, less oxygen in that water.